money when it is perhaps for a collateral purpose, especially if it was such as intimidation or exploitation, is essentially the same sort of problem. And that leads in to my final example, my third issue, which is about abuse of power. In the Bates litigation and in the inquiry, we've heard some toe curling evidence about the standard contract that all sub postmasters were required to sign. And the heart of the unfairness was a provision which predated Horizon and which said that sub postmasters were responsible for all losses, which were the result of mistakes in their branch. Now, when the accounts were prepared on paper in the branch pre Horizon, the sub postmaster had full control of the process. And so that provision may have been fair enough. But once the accounts were produced by an IT system, which the sub postmaster had no control over and very little visibility into, it should obviously have been reconsidered. In fact, the opposite happened. The post office doubled down on that provision in the contract. And because it would not admit that Horizon could produce erroneous figures, it enforced it on the basis that all losses in the accounts were due to mistakes or theft within the branch. And it seems that the lawyers advised on operations and procedures which made enforcement of that provision super easy with minimal process. And then if a sub postmaster did have the temerity to challenge that provision in the contract or indeed in general, challenge the post office's position, it seems that they would be absolutely hammered. Mr. Castleton has said in his testimony that he was warned that the post office would ruin him if he continued fighting. And indeed they did ruin him. That over mighty approach seems to have carried through to the Bates litigation. It may have carried through into the Hamilton appeals and arguably, it is still a characteristic of the way the post office is dealing with sub postmasters through the compensation proceedings ongoing. At no stage did the post office's legal strategy appear to recognise that its long term interests might be better served if it behaves like a trustworthy business partner rather than a bully. And that ties into my closing thought about acting in a client's best interests. It may be that this foundational conduct principle needs a bit of supplementing or supercharging or somehow um, supporting in the modern world of very big, powerful institutions. It seems likely to me that when the principle first rose or in its early history, the fiduciary relationship between a lawyer and a client would nearly always be a pretty straightforward power dynamic with the professional clearly more powerful than the client, not only in terms of legal skill and knowledge, but also in terms of standing, position, influence, etc. Nowadays, many lawyers are far less powerful than their clients, particularly when they are in-house. But this is also true of the external lawyer keen to curry favour with a big, important client. And so the final um, snippet from the post office that I'll refer to is the year 2013, which was a very interesting point in the history. Two damning advices were written by a barrister employed by an external firm. And instead of those advices prompting a wholesale rethink of the convictions secured over the preceding 13 years, it took another seven years for those convictions to begin to be overturned. A few months after the advices were produced, the then general, general counsel at the post office disappeared in circumstances which are not yet clear. When the inquiry reaches that part of the story, it will be very interesting. And I suspect a relevant consideration in due course will be what do we expect of lawyers in-house or otherwise, when their clients are powerful enough to ruin their careers. I'm sure most of us like to think that we would risk our job in order to meet our ethical obligations, 
but giving advice that is in the client's long term best interests. Unwelcome advice, which upholds the lawyer's integrity. Well, those long term best interests and the lawyer's integrity, they are both mutable concepts, no doubt very easily affected by self-protective psychological biases. And I'm afraid that poor conduct may have been quite widespread amongst those who acted for the post office. So the only reliable tool that I can think of to guard against poor practice when your client is very powerful is the imaginary conversation with the most decent person you can think of. That person may even be your local sub postmaster. If you tell yourself the situation is too complicated and they wouldn't understand, I suspect you're probably kidding yourself. As someone who's spent most of my time in criminal practice, I've had lots of conversations with people who ask how I can act for someone who is guilty. And I explain about due process and ethical, the ethical orthodoxy that tells me that if they're guilty, I can still act, but I can't advance any positive defence. However, I also explain that I have to advise my client in their best interests that saying nothing positively about their defence during a trial is highly unlikely to lead to a good outcome for them. So most people can understand perfectly well the ethical situation. Whilst it is important to have a fair trial whenever a defendant denies the offence, even if the evidence appears strong, when they admit they are guilty, in light of the duty not to mislead the court, the lawyer will usually give clear advice to plead guilty because it's very likely to be in their client's best interests. A decent person doesn't have any difficulty understanding this, and the process of stepping back and explaining it is a useful reminder. So if that process of stepping back and explaining a difficult situation leads a lawyer to think that they really should give unwelcome advice in order to maintain their own integrity, I suspect that unwelcome advice will also be in the client's long term best interests. It seems to me that is the principal lesson for lawyers from the post office saga, because it is quite a cautionary tale. And I think it will become much more cautionary over the next year or two for many lawyers involved. So I think I'm passing over to Dr. Brenner at this point. Thank you very much, Flora. Um, if I'm next on. Uh, I, sh I should um, have made confession right at the beginning. I'm not steeped in the post office scandal to the same level as my co-panelists. I've, I've read several witness statements by current and former post office employees, and I reviewed um, some of the documents disclosed in the inquiry. I've also watched uh, several hours of, uh, of witness as being cross-examined. I can also draw on my own research into uh, corporate compliance and my own experiences for several decades working in financial services compliance with corporate boards. Um, I'm not going to go in detail through all my various points. I'll just headline some of them and uh, depending on uh, how discussion uh, develops uh, during the Q&A session, uh, we can look at some of these in more detail. Right, my key themes are first, from what I've seen, there appears to be a widespread, what I call, absence of thought. Uh, part of this is a, a minimization of uh, issues, a minimization of complaints, a minimization of, of, of people raising concerns. Um, just one example is uh, uh, a reaction by the post office. You can see it in the quotes, uh, quoted in the loop message from Mark Davis. Uh, to the post office uh, communications team dated uh, uh, 25 uh, June 2015. This communication states um, that he uh, tries to minimize the horizon issues by saying that, um, amongst other things, there have only been 135 individual complaints about the system over 10 years, and therefore there's no systemic uh, issue. Uh, I, I'm, I'm afraid 
I've seen this several times and might look at what the then chief executive of um, Wells Fargo uh, Bank said in the US and a similar uh, type of um, issue where uh, problems that emerged. And he said, oh, it's only 1% of employees have raised complaints. Um, there were, however, fundamental issues. If only there had been greater thought uh, delivered in uh, looking at what had actually happened. My, my second point, which relates to this, is a lack of introspection, um, coupled with a certain, uh, using the German phrase, Arbeitsfreude, or satisfaction in achieving the task in hand, which becomes dominant, rather than thinking about what you're actually doing. Um, the result is viewing um, uh, everything with a muted conscience. Uh, this is a process of following the herd without any self-reflection, and it can also be seen in um, the use of language, a displacement, a, a debasement of language. My third one is organization structures and silos. Um, many organizations operate with structural silos, and this can exacerbate um, the development of what are called cultural silos, where problems become isolated within those silos. Uh, the fourth point is um, the pressure to be a team player. Social silence structures, symbols and complicity. Inwardness, looking inward, not looking at what's going on outside, and a high level of what I call tribalism. The pressures within a business can be immense. There are several trite phrases used throughout these types of businesses. Be a team player, get on side, don't rock the boat, and so on. Again, all of these um, uh, are, 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 um, have the effect of reducing people's uh, ability to develop their own thought and express themselves in a way which resonates and uh, gets higher up through the organization. The fifth one is seeing everything through a business-centric lens. Um, this is assisted by a process of what's well known as ethical fade, aided by self-deception. It allows the business uh, person to behave self interestedly while at the same time believing that uh, they uphold uh, their moral principles. It's based on a process of routinization of decisions and employing a language of euphemism, again, absence of thought. Uh, the penultimate point I'd want to look at is um, what's called casting a shadow. Uh, individuals in senior roles uh, do not pay enough attention to the shadow they cast on those around them. Staff are always looking up at them and seeing what their bosses do and taking a lead from them. This creates a shadow for good or ill. And the final point is uh, management hubris. We see it all too often in many, many issues, uh, not just the post office. It's um, the self-justification of non-compliance, um, where, let's call it, individuals become sort of semi-conscious uh, and they start to have a positive self-image, which distorts their ethical deliberations in a way which presents it themselves in a, it presents it to themselves in a positive light. I'm struck by how this lack of respect and humility uh, was exhibited in all that I've seen and read in the scandal, both from post office lawyers and investigators. I look to see what the senior management and boards have to say when they give their evidence. I'll stop at that point and uh, head across to Richard. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Flora. <laughs> it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. The, um, I can literally talk for hours about the post office scandal. So what I've tried to do is boil down a couple of three points, really, for about 10, 12 minutes. Um, I see the post office scandal as covering three main phases. So you've got up to about 2013 or 14 when the post office sued and prosecuted sub postmasters, as you've seen on the ITV drama. Um, 2013 onwards, when they discovered there were big flaws in their cases, but continue to defend their actions and the computer system, the first cover up, if you like. And then 2019 onwards, when those flaws were discovered, in part because they're still coming out during the Bates Group litigation, and one might allege that that might be the second cover up. Um, 
as well as being the biggest miscarriage of justice, I'm on record as saying it's probably going to be the biggest professional misconduct scandal that this country has ever seen. It brings into its orbit one Supreme Court justice, a former president, at least four KCs, several other barristers from the so-called independent bar and indeed from solicitors from private practice, at least three general counsel, probably more, I think, at least two firms of solicitors and many other in-house lawyers, two of which so far, I emphasise so far, have been given self-incrimination warnings. All of these lawyers have questions to answer. Some, I think, will be merely embarrassed by the process. Some will, I think, be disciplined and some might even be prosecuted through the criminal courts. That the problem spread over such a length of time, it's more than 20 years, and such a wide range of practitioners, esteemed and more lowly, suggests a wider problem than that of the post office and a few bad apples. What I thought I'd do tonight, though, is concentrate on matters of most interest to in-house lawyers of the back fee kind. Uh, so I'll concentrate on general counsel, barristers and civil elements of the case. And rather than try to take you through each element of the story, let me suggest some high level problems. So the first is the development of clever legal strategies and counsel to the inquiry. Jason Beer Casey has referred to Lee Castleton's case being marked by a nice legal point from a chancery barrister. Um, clever legal strategies, and I've seen this in other cases, can lead to forensic and ethical mistakes. The post office sought in the Castleton case and indeed in the Bates case to rely on what they wanted the evidence to say rather than what the evidence really did say. And they did so through shifts in the burden of proof and so on. This has led to what appears to be very serious failures to disclose material evidence, criticism for the portrayal of the cases on misleading bases by counsel and the post office itself, the presentation of witness statements at odds with the underlying documentary and oral evidence, as you've heard from Flora, and the putting on the stand of witnesses apparently unaware of their own written evidence and certainly tending to give evidence adverse to it and adverse to themselves. So let's suppose this is a slip rather than deliberate professional misconduct, something which I have to say sometimes seems a rather generous interpretation on the evidence, but even so, let's suppose it's a slip. The supposedly clever strategy may have persuaded the lawyers they didn't need to worry so much about the adverse evidence that lay on the file or in the post office's uh, conversations with them, or that it wasn't relevant and so didn't really need to be disclosed. Uh, if we don't think it's a slip, alternative explanations are of course likely worse. Now, an interesting question about these sorts of processes might be how much of these problems, the misleading, the problems of the evidence and so on, is the responsibility of the lawyer and how much of the client? Um, the, court of a, the Court of Appeal case of Faruqi reminds the lawyers that they are responsible for the case strategy. They are responsible for the case strategy and cannot distance themselves by simply saying they're relying on the client's instructions. So that's point one on that. Uh, also, though, the practicalities of managing the strategy and tactics require lawyers to be across the evidence and thinking very carefully about what the documents show. And for some reason in the post office case, this was often not done in a way consistent with what I would regard as professional obligations. Now, sometimes the examples are very stark indeed. So, for instance, in 2013, in a criminal case, the post office was told has touched on this, that a key witness on the criminal cases, Gareth Jenkins, was unreliable and shouldn't be relied on again in 2013. Now, we know also that the solicitors who ran the Bates case were aware, were aware of that at the time in 2013. And we know that the general counsel for the post office in the Bates case was made aware of that and or reminded of it in 2016, I think, by advice by Jonathan Swift QC, as he then was. And yet, come 2019, Gareth Jenkins was giving evidence by proxy behind the scenes in the Bates case and potentially misleading reasons were given to the court and to the claim claimants as to why he wasn't called. Mr Justice Fraser spotted both the problem and the factual weaknesses in the evidence being given. History had repeated itself. Jenkins was being used when he was unreliable, but this time with apparent extra deviousness. The lawyers were aware of the risk, 
Uh, is there another explanation? I don't know. Or were they recklessly misleading the court or worse? We'll have to wait and see what the inquiry makes of it. OK, the second way of thinking about aggressive strategy is to think about the substance and tenor of advice. It's often about process and tenor and approach. Now, I'm imagining the audience is familiar with the point that the post office tried to get Mr Justice Fraser recused in the High Court trial, whilst, as it happens, and I think this might be a coincidence, whilst the post office witness was imploding in the witness box. You might be less aware that the inquiry has started to reveal that the advice process behind the, uh, the, the sorry, the inquiry has started to reveal the advice process behind the recusal application. Lord Newberger advised on the prospects of success and as did Lord Grabener. Both were, if I've understood it correctly, wheeled out before the board to advise them on prospects of success and both advised positively on those prospects. Indeed, we're told by uh, counsel to the inquiry, Lord Grabener told the board they had no option, no option but to proceed with the recusal application. Now, we don't know yet enough to judge the merits of that advice, although positive advice seems a bit surprising. But counsel to the inquiry has dwelt, emphasised, if you like, Grabener's you have no choice line to the board. And he's also emphasised the sense that the big guns were being deliberately wheeled out before the board to make agreeing to the recusal strategy inevitable. It's worth emphasising here, if they'd succeeded, an absolutely massive injustice would have remained hidden. It's a crucial point in the story. There are several other problems with this moment, including whether Lord Newberger should have been advising at all as a former president of the Supreme Court, and whether the chairman of Her Majesty's Courts and Tribunal Services should have been present at the meeting, meeting, which he seems to have been as chair of the post office. But in professional ethics terms, it seems to me Lord Grabener, who is in the inquiry's fiercest spotlight. One last example, the Swift Review. Tim Parker was brought into Brint brought in as chairman of the post office. I think it's 2015, but Flora might correct me in a minute. The government minister responsible for the post office was then Baroness Neville Rolfs, Rolf, uh, Rolf, 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 I think. She impressed upon him the need to get on top of whether anything had gone wrong at the post office as he took up his chairmanship. It was agreed he would instruct Jonathan Swift, KC, as he then was, to conduct a review. Now, the swift review was, in my eyes, something of a curate's egg. There were some very pointed criticisms of what post office had done and also reassurance of the elements of what had been done and the Horizon software itself was fundamentally sound. Now, mysteriously, for reasons which I'm sure you can all guess at, the positive message only got reported to Parliament, none of the negatives. Parker, Parker reported a somewhat roast interview of the Swift report to the minister too. So the independent review was filtered through various levels, the lawyers, the chairman, up to the minister. More extraordinarily, on the advice of Post Office's general counsel, um, uh, um, Tim Parker did not disclose the swift review to the board. She, the general counsel, was worried, it, 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 we're told, that professional privilege might have been breached. Perhaps there was a Three Rivers problem floating in her mind, or perhaps something else was going on. One of the points in the swift review was a carefully phrased but very clear warning, I would say, that the post officer had not been, the post office had not been telling the truth about remote access. This was something that the post office continued to defend or deny, at least until partway into the Bates proceedings. This remote access problem, lack of security of the system, was crucial to all of the criminal convictions being quashed in 2021, just as an example of something within the Swift report, a real ticking bomb, actually. So whether keeping Swift away from the board was a question of the general counsel not knowing the client or misunderstanding privilege or the general counsel in keeping trouble general counsel trying to keep troubling information away from the board, which I'm told by general counsel is something, a phenomenon that they're asked to do, or part of a broader strategy of damage limitation or covering up, depending on which language you wish to use. It's not really for me to say. We're going to again have to wait for the inquiry. But it does indicate how central lawyers and legal advice are to the third phase of the scandal. They were, in essence, it seemed to me, uh, uh, 
involved in what looks like, and again, it's only an allegation at this stage, but look like, looks like two phases of cover-up, 2013 to the Bates trial, and then uh, uh, after that. So if the cover-up kills you, uh, sorry, two, uh, up to 2013 is the first, uh, uh, and then after that. If the cover-up kills you, what, what happens when it happens twice, I wonder? Each of, each of these examples, I would say, is marked by a lack of independence. And indeed, as Flora said, a lack of integrity sometimes. Lawyers telling clients what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear, basing what they say on the client's preferences or the client tells them about the evidence rather than the actual evidence. Let me end with a quick note which might suggest one idea about where this problem comes from, and it's basically a quote about culture. It's a quote that comes from a website advising a barrister's services. It's a client testimonial. It's one of those legal 500 quotes that your chambers or sorry, those of you who are in chambers quite often uh, chambers puts this sort of thing on the on the sites. It says this about the barrister. He's off the scale in terms of his ability to deal with difficult and serious matters. You get him out for the largest clients who need the best advice and he delivers it with great humour and aplomb. He can hold the board of a very large company in the palm of his hand. And this is the bit that I think is really interesting. He'll turn a pile of refuse into something that looks great. It's an absolute art form. Want to guess which barrister that is, I ask you, and how much he gets paid? I'm wondering if you can guess. And uh, a, a more serious question, whether the buying and selling of this attitude might have something to do with professional ethics. And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, Professor Moorhead. So um, I think at this stage, if I can invite people who want to ask questions, if they can raise their hand on the uh, on the WebEx screen. Um, and just whilst we're waiting for that, perhaps I can kick off with one. Um, I, I think there's a distinction between obviously self-evidently bad behaviours and what could be termed flaws in the human character. So Dr. Brenner talked about sort of tribalism, um, casting a shadow. Uh, do you think it's possible to achieve perfect compliance with ethical obligations? Uh, or do those flaws in the human nature mean that it's, it's simply never going to be attainable? The Can I... I, I, I want to slightly query the premise of the question because I actually think the boundary between um, biases, slips and clear errors is actually quite permeable. And um, what you see sometimes with the lawyers who have slid into misconduct is they don't recognise the point at which they have crossed the line. They don't recognise the point at which their strategy or their behaviour has become misleading or they have failed in their disclosure obligations. Um, uh, when they really should recognise it. So there's a there's a um, Alistair Brett, the t lawyer for the Times, gave evidence to the Levis inquiry. If you ever have a, an idle hour or two, and you can find his testimony online, you can watch he, how he's taken by Levison and um, uh, Mr. Justice Jay, as he now is, through his process of handling that case, and how he's seen to slide from a clever strategy into something which is obviously misleading. Uh, and he cannot see it. He simply cannot recognise or he's not willing to admit what he's done. It's, it, and I think probably at the time he didn't quite realise what he was doing. And yet he was very close to um, lying, actually, to the court. It was a very direct example of misleading. He just didn't recognise he'd crossed that boundary. So I think actually that's the more perfection is not the issue, actually. It's just stopping these actually really egregious errors through some of the things that Alan uh, was talking about, which is routinization and carelessness and seeing things through the business's eyes and all those kinds of things, rather than standing back and saying, well, hang on a minute, can I actually say this? Should I actually say this? Uh, I see we have a hand raised by John A. So unless anybody else wants to come in on that, perhaps I'm going to invite John A to ask his question. Hello. Um, interesting. I come from a different background from IT moving over into law, right? So 
your question around um I have a question around advancement of IT leading to a lack of reporting for errors within the systems in general. So there are companies and some of the biggest companies that we have have no way outside of their ecosystem of collating that information. And that leads to the group think um, and speak that you talked about and everyone saying there's no errors within the system because Unfortunately, they don't actually record them in the way that you're expecting, and then they only report on a percentage. So if you're like, I don't want to name them, but if you're like one of the biggest ones, two or three percent actually is in the millions in terms of how many people are reporting an error versus some smaller companies where two or three percent is only less. So they report one or two, three percent of issues. Everyone says this, this should still go ahead regardless of the implication, but actually, um, isn't it a obligation as general counsel to look objectively around what people are saying? And if all you're getting is the kumbaya effect of everything is rosy, that probing that you would naturally do as a criminal barrister looking at the adverse side of this should come out. Does that kind of make sense, my question? Yeah, I, 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 I'll have a go. <laughs> Um, I think there are, it's complicated in this particular example by the fact that uh, Fujitsu on the one hand and Post Office on the other hand uh, were not doing, they, sometimes they were doing the same thing in lockstep and sometimes they were not and so sometimes Fujitsu would share information with the Post Office and the Post Office may or may not then share it with the sub postmaster. Sometimes Fujitsu was keeping information back from post office. Um, and so it's not always necessarily the case that general counsel at the post office would have been able to have the information at their fingertips. But what we have heard something of is that Fujitsu, there is some emerging evidence to suggest that Fujitsu was not revealing that it did have a, a composite of known errors. So they they were keeping records of all their errors and, and there was such a thing as the known error log. They were very unwilling to produce it during the group litigation. And there's now some evidence to suggest that even at an earlier stage, they were telling their own expert witnesses not to refer to it when they went into litigation. So the extent to which post office should have and could have asked questions of um, of them, yeah, I mean it's a tricky one. I mean we're still I, I I'm still wondering why the post office didn't bring Fujitsu in as a third party into the group litigation. You know, there's a lot of questions still about that. Um, and and what was going? When were they in tandem and when were they not? Is a big question. Can I can I come in with one quick point, um, James? Which is which, uh, the so one of the things that I've I'm intrigued by is um, I get quite a lot of lawyers probably have this as well. A lot of people from the IT side saying lawyers just don't understand IT systems. They do not understand how IT systems work. They have very strange ideas about predictability and so on and so forth and error, which are flawed. Now, I don't really understand what they mean, but it seems to be a very interesting point that they're trying to make, which I suspect is actually more about complex systems than IT per se. Uh, and uh, that might be something that Backfee might want to think about as an, a, an event for another day, which is, you know, what do lawyers really need to know about when they don't know things about these kinds of systems? Because that's part of the problem. You can definitely see it in some of the evidence the lawyers relying on. Stephen Dilley did it in evidence. He kind of fell back on this really strange basic idea about what, what, why there weren't any errors, which was kind of magical thinking, really. It was completely wrong, and you could see it was completely wrong, and yet he still relied on it in his evidence to the inquiry, you know, all these years later when he knows he, he knows what he's up against, if you like. Sorry, there's a light flashing. I'll try and turn that off in a minute. But the, uh, yeah, so I think uh, lawyers understand, more completely aside from the post office, lawyers understanding complex systems and IT is quite, quite an important thing that may be a competence gap. Dr. Brown, did you want to come in on that? Yeah, sorry. Yes, thanks very much. Um, I think that there's a 
a, a, an issue for boards generally, whether it's the post office or anyone else, that there's a generally a lack of uh, detailed IT architectural um, knowledge on boards and in, certainly in some senior management areas. Because um, you can see this all the way through, not just in this particular uh, for the post office, but other uh, examples where people uh, retreat and say, well, I'm not an expert on IT. I just say, I follow what the IT experts tell me, which to be honest is not good enough. Um, if you're in a senior position making decisions, part of that competence is having an understanding of the IT and it's competent on the IT specialist be able to explain what they are doing in language that um, people who do not have that level of expertise can understand. It's what they should be doing, just like lawyers explaining to the client in language that uh, the clients will understand. The same thing applies to IT specialists. They need to be able to explain to boards and other senior management what is going on, what are the weaknesses. Boards need to have their own uh, level of expertise in terms of being able to understand what has been said to them and to ask the right questions and to follow up those questions. Thank you. Nicola, you have your hand raised. Do you want to raise a question? Yes, and in fact, sorry, can you all hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. In fact, it actually follows on quite nicely from the last comment that Alan had mentioned about the role of boards. And I'm speaking now as not only a barrister, but somebody who actually sits on boards and have chaired boards in the past. Um, thankfully, not in anything as catastrophic as what's happened with the post office scandal. But Alan, going back to the beginning of your presentation, you mentioned um, six points, two of which I'd like to uh, ask you about. One is about organisation structures and silos. And the other one is about seeing everything through a business um, centred lens. Now, where do you think an effective board and non-executive directors and chairs, where do you think they fit in with those challenges? It might, you've just talked about the, um, the lack of knowledge of the IT architecture. It might not be about IT, it might be about something else. But where do you think, because an effective board should really challenge anything that even smells a bit dodgy, but, um, I don't know whether they did in this case, but quite often we know that boards often don't do that. And I, I'm just um, conscious about that, and particularly with the comment that I think Richard um, said about a particular um, silk. And I know who that person is. I know who the comments about, uh, about him holding a board in the palm of his hand. So that is also of concern because a board is supposed to be a check and balance on things. But if you don't have an effective board, um, how do you think this would play out? Um, right. Uh, thanks, Nicola. Um, there's a lot in your great question. Um, I doubt we've got time to go through all of them um, in, in any detail at all. You know, I just pick up two points. One is layers within an organisation. Uh, again, based on my own experience, any information coming up through more than two layers uh, to a board is uh, so, um, how to put, uh, modified is probably the best way of putting it, uh, that it becomes near enough worthless. Uh, uh, Organisations need, need to be as broad as possible, the least number of layers, and certainly information coming up to the board or the senior executive teams needs to come through very directly and not be filtered. Um, the more filtration, the weaker it gets. It's just human nature, that's what happens. Uh, the other one is to do with the role of non-exec directors. Uh, I, I think, sorry, there's a whole history of non-exec directors. I think the expectations placed on non-exec directors, um, let's call it, is probably greater than the the role can sustain, simply because of the time available, uh, the ability to meet frequently and uh, enough to be able to follow through issues. Uh, lack of, uh, in many cases, detailed knowledge of the organisation and the need to um, delve into issues in in some detail and for with persistence. These are all issues that non-exec directors have generally, um, not, not peculiar to the post office at all. And um, there may be a case for having what are called professional directors, uh, independent directors, um, who can allocate sufficient time with sufficient expertise. I talked about the IT side, but this is a much, much broader um, issue. Laura, do you want to come in on that? Um, I think that there might be some useful 
wisdom which um, I, I can't claim for myself, but which came from experienced general counsel, which was that if something smells a bit bad, I think that was a, a term you were using there, Nicola, if you sort of, if as a board, something smells a bit bad, it's a good idea to name that quickly. Um, because if it sits around smelling bad for a while, then people feel that they have to do something to kind of justify why they haven't said something about the bad smell. Whereas if get as soon used as it, to bad smell as well, they, sorry? Become, they can become nose blind. They can become used to it. It all it all just becomes part of the um, the the ongoing business. Whereas if as soon as there's that feeling that something's not right, it gets named, it gets put out there, and everyone recognises that that something needs to be done about it. That's probably going to set you off on a much better course than if everyone has a bit of a quiet think for a while. Thank you. Thank you. David, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yes, please. Thank you for an excellent talk so far, by the way. Um, my question um, relates to lessons perhaps learned from the financial services industry. So we've been through our own scandals over many years uh, in many situations in financial services, as a result of which we now have things like the senior managers uh, and certification regime. We have things like whistleblower hotlines. We have a huge regu regulatory drive on culture. Um, and as a result, I can testify, <clears throat> it's a lot easier to be an independent lawyer today than it was 20 years ago in, in that industry. Do you think there are lessons there for other organisations to draw on? Can I come in first? I know Alan's definitely going to want to come in. <laughs> Me and Alan have written about the senior managers regime, although it was mainly Alan, I have to say. The um, the so I've heard this a lot, David, from in-house lawyers uh, in, in recent the last year or two, and also from people involved in money laundering. They say the senior managers regime makes a really significant difference to their independence and the quality of their working environment and other things. So I I would just say I really think it's a really interesting point that needs a lot of exploration and some emphasis behind it because it, I'm picking this up so regularly now that it does suggest to me it might be part of the solution. There will be pushback about transaction costs and so on and so forth um, but um, and Alan will talk probably a bit about some of that in a minute but they, I, I really think it's a great idea. Uh, should I come in at that point? Oh, Alan, please. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, uh, I live and breathe for the financial services um, world. I've been there for decades and uh, study it. Now, we're actually doing some empirical research on the senior managers regime and how it's actually working in practice, uh, which um, hopefully will come out later this year. Uh, but uh, it it works um, to a certain extent. I don't want to over, um, let's call it, uh, egg what goes on with the senior managers regime. Uh, but part of the issue is that it, it does require a regulator uh, an effective regulator in, in obviously in the case of financial services industry a number of regulators uh, and uh, I not certain how it would apply in, um, in practice in had been thought through in terms of, let's call it uh, general industries outside financial services where you don't have this the set of dedicated regulators uh, the uh, there the culture and uh, ethics element that's gone on that's very good. Again, um, it requires uh, people to drive it, and uh, we hope we hope that industries, individual companies, will do it themselves. But again, they may not. It may be necessary to have you know a, a regulator that does that. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this, but I've written a book on it, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, that, that's available. I'll stop at this point though. Do we have any more questions? Probably got time for one or two more. OK, can I ask, indulge myself and ask one final question? Clearly, there is a line to be drawn, as, as you identified, between overzealousness and fearlessly promoting your clients' interests. And it's often clear with with 
2020 hindsight where that line should be drawn. But I think experience shows when you're in, in the thick of it, often they're very fine judgment calls. And it's actually quite difficult to get them consistently right through the life of a matter or a case. So do you have any guidance for those in attendance? Where, where do you draw that line? And do you think the code of conduct's got it right? The, um, I think um, I, there are people from the Bar Council, and I think the Bar Standards Board here, I'm probably going to slightly upset them now. Um, I think the Bar's code of conduct is a mess, um, and it's a good hard look, and I think they, there needs to be some thought about, particularly for in-houses, about consistency between the um, S SRA's rules and the bar's rules uh, as well, but there are different standards of dishonesty in the code, and it's kind of it's just a it's just a kind of soup of different problems. The um, I think there is there, there there are particular gaps around in-house practice in both professions uh, in terms of the code, and the I think the codes are generally all right in the SRA's terms, but more around the guidance. So there are some issues you could sort of argue um about so those would be the two main points i think i would make about the um the code i think there is there's a really strong and in, one of the things that in-house lawyers talk to me most about is actually flora's challenge which is what do you do when you feel like you have to say no uh, i've been doing a piece of work with karen noakes from ucl as one of alan's colleagues talking to in-house lawyers who have faced that exact challenge uh, and also talking to uh, general counsel about concerns about lack of clarity about how you report up what you have to do guidance and support around that and issues around confidentiality and so on and so forth so i think they're really big problems that probably need a really concerted effort to try to provide both rules and guidance and institutions which support in-house lawyers when they have those problems. Anybody else want to come in on that point? Yeah, I think um, there is obviously, there must be a point where lawyers who do something wrong cross a line. Um, but I, I rather suspect that The actions that happen before they actually cross the line are the ones that you can do something about. I think at the point that you are going to cross the line, a bit like Richard was saying, you may have got so steeped in your own wrong culture and wrong headedness that you're not you're not going to catch yourself at that point. Um, I, I think that you have to be on the alert long before you're crossing a line um, to the, the potential for you to do so. Uh, it, it, and and I think it's probably only that that's going to allow you to to stay sort of safe. I don't know if that's of any use as no, an answer. Absolutely, absolutely. I All right. You know, the only thing Sorry. I was going to just Stop only thing I was going to mention very briefly is to say that I completely agree with what Richard was saying. That it's very rare that people are um, faced with a a decision which is going to be the make or break decision. It's normally a series of incremental steps. Um, and it also depends on the framing, how the question or the point of issue is framed, uh, the situation, everything else. Um, it's the ability to recognise at a very early stage uh, where this might lead. And I think that the inquiry, almost certainly there will be key elements in that which will form a training package for future um, executives, um, uh, investigators, uh, lawyers to say, um, think very carefully because if you do the wrong thing, you might one day have to face this level of cross-examination in the cold light of dawn. How will your actions look? How would what you've written, how will they look at that time? Yeah, I mean, if I were to go back to the witness statement example, um, I think if you if you start a witness statement, if every time you start a witness statement, you give yourself a little talking to that says, you know, I must not massage the facts, you know, 
um, I think you're going to be much safer than if you get halfway through writing the witness statement and then you write the sentence, which is actually the misleading one. You're not going to spot it because you're too far down the track. Thank you. So conscious of the time, um, that was obviously a very substantial topic um, and there's only so much of an inroad we can make in an hour. Um, but it was really insightful and incredibly thought provoking. And so I just want to say a big thank you on behalf uh, of BACPI and everybody in attendance uh, to the panel uh, and indeed every, to everybody in attendance for, for joining. So uh, with that, we'll draw to a conclusion. Thank you. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.